All right, welcome today. Um, I have the pleasure of speaking with Orthodox fiction author, Alex Scott, and he has written the newest publication that will be coming out October 31st with Park Inn Books, Feast of the Sisters, and it is a young adult novel um, that includes vampires. So today we're going to talk a little bit more with Alex, who's completing his graduate degree um, as we speak. And so I'm going to ask him a few questions to share with our audience today, um, a little bit more about himself and the book that he's written. So can you tell us a little bit more um, about uh, your background in writing? Okay. Well, I enjoyed coming up with stories my whole life, uh, but it wasn't really until college that I suddenly thought, hey, I could be a writer. I can do this. Since then, I've submitted short stories to some places, gotten published in a few. Uh, some years ago, I was on this message board and we collaborated on a couple of short story collections, uh, A Light in the Dark and Smoke and Flame. And I actually contributed a chapter from what became Feast of the Sisters to one of them, uh, very different from the final product. Uh, I was also in a local writing group, and one year we put out our own zine, which I edited. And I've also done a bunch of self-publishing, a lot of it short fiction. But uh, back in 2017, I put out this uh, middle grade fantasy novel, Threshold to Grand Dream, that I'm really proud of. Um, and... Uh, and this year I uh, started at Substack where I've been posting more fiction. Okay, wonderful. Well, we look forward to reading those other works from you um, after we all read Feast of the Sisters. Um, so what was the inspiration for this young adult novel? Well, it was kind of twofold um, and kind of, kind of geeky too. Uh, back in high school, I wrote a story for a creative writing class about Dracula hiding out in America under an assumed identity. And the, the idea had always stuck around in the back of my head. And then uh, some years back, I was watching a YouTube playthrough of Castlevania, Rondo of Blood. Uh, and in that game, uh, one of your playable characters is this little girl who's been rescued from Dracula's castle. And she goes back to fight Dracula herself and rescue other village girls. And I thought about like, like that kind of situation playing out in modern times and then I combined that with the old Dracula idea, and before I knew it, I knew who my main characters were and how it would end. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to the setting. Uh, the town that it's set in, Terrace, Tennessee, is a fictional town strongly inspired by Pikeville, Tennessee, okay. which is where my mother grew up, and uh, where my grandfather also worked as a doctor. And some of Joe's relationship with her father draws from that. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'm in Kentucky, so some of the kind of scenery and small townness uh, was very relatable and familiar to me as I was reading um, the book. Um, do you plan? Yeah. Do you plan on writing more? So it sounds like you have some other ideas in the queue. Oh, absolutely. Uh, grad school's been keeping me busy right now, but I'm trying to get in any writing I can. Uh, got some unpublished novels on my hard drive. Uh, more short stories I'm shopping around and. Uh, I'm serializing a, a children's novel on Substack right now uh, called Fair Exchange, about a fifth grade class whose new exchange student is a spoiled aristocratic girl from the realm of fairy. Hmm, that sounds interesting. I've got a third third grader, so that she'll be interested in that one, I'm sure. Okay. Um, what What is the role of monster books in Christian fiction? That's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure a lot of people necessarily associate monsters with Christian fiction, but in a way, they're a perfect fit for it. You have monster stories in the Bible and some stories about the saints, uh, monsters all through European folklore, dragons and dragon slayers, goblins, malicious fairies, Baba Yaga. And of course, a lot of our understanding of vampires originates in Eastern European folklore, like the Strigoi and Moroi in Transylvania, or the Rikolakas in Greece. Uh, and even the modern vampire is already very strongly associated with Christianity, especially liturgical Christianity. After all, in the original Dracula, uh, even though the characters are, all, are presumably committed to Anglicans, uh, it's Van Helsing's explicitly Catholic paraphernalia that's used against the vampire. There's uh, also a Serbian vampire called After 90 Years by Milovan Glicic. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Not very familiar with Serbian, uh, with a very unique portrayal of a vampire from an Orthodox perspective, and uh, uh, I actually drew on some of that for uh, 
Amelia in Feast of the Sisters. So it's why uh, it's why moths figure so prominently. Okay, wonderful. So how going from monsters and then continuing to vampires? So how do vampire books help us to understand human nature? Well, as I see it, vampires represent the seductive power of sin. Mm -hmm. uh, vampires don't just use violence and force. They lure, they sneak, they hypnotize. They make themselves irresistible. And in another sense, they're about the tendency to use others as a means to an end and treat them as disposable. I think that's part of why arist er, ugh, sorry, aristocratic vampires like Dracula resonate so much in our culture. It's the upper class literally feeding off the lower class in order to survive. And that's where it leads to a third point, which is how they take advantage of customs and etiquette in order to get what they want, like how a vampire can only enter when they're invited, or even hospitality is turned against itself. Mm. At the same time, a vampire is kind of a pitiful, pitiful figure. They live forever, but they have to kill other people to survive. Uh, they're in some ways more vulnerable than mortals. In a way, they're not truly free because they live so much according to need. This kind of points to the idea of sin and evil as a diminishment of who we really are and who we're really capable of being. They're basically what it's like to be under the thrall of your own cravings. Okay. Um, so kind of continuing that, how does seeing the fight against evil manifest physically help people understand that God is with us in real, li in real life spiritual warfare? Well, monsters such as vampires are personifications or embodiments of various forms of evil. They give us a way to name these evils, explore their possibilities, and confront them in ways we wouldn't be able to in real life. They also ask us who or what we're with we are willing to fight and sacrifice and die for, which is the essence of Christ-like love. Like I said in the last point, vampires are vulnerable. Vulnerable. It might take a lot of pain and tribulation, and Jesus never promised it to be comfortable, uh, but they can be defeated. And the tools that God gave us to fight the devil, like the cross and the holy water and the sacraments, also tend to repel the undead. Okay. <clears throat> Um, well, I have been really enjoying the book. Um, I'm reading the art, one of the art copies um, and looking forward to this being in print and available on October 31st. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us about Feast of the Sisters? I think that's everything, um, everything I wanted to say. Okay, wonderful. Well, I've enjoyed this um, interview with you and to learn more about your background and more about monster books and vampires mm -hmm. and how they re relate to Christianity. And I think it's wonderful that we are going to add an Orthodox vampire book um, to our mm -hmm. lineup at Park and Books. So right. thank you so much for being a contributor and joining us in this interview today. All right. Thank you.